thank you very much for the introduction and for everyone coming here to the event today. Uh, I will give a basic outline of the, of the key findings of this report and then, of course, what matters most is what this information implies and, and how we can respond to it so that the response is more inclusive to these groups. Uh, as you said, the, the report was uh, identified as you know, addressing a gap in, in the available information. So we're looking, for this report, we're looking at persons with specific needs, meaning chronic disease, di impairment, and injury. We've seen uh, that information on these groups was missing so far, was not sufficient to inform uh, uh, a response that, that adequately targets vulnerability um, and, and the most urgent needs. So that's the information gap that's being filled by this quantitative and qualitative data uh, that I'll present today. So we're hoping also to provide a, a new perspective on these groups. What does it mean to have a chronic disease, an injury, or an impairment when <coughs> you are displaced? What does it mean when you are finding yourself in a protected crisis situation? So, and how do these vulnerabilities interact uh, and, and influence each other? So to give you a quick overview of where we have uh, conducted this assessment, we have uh, in total interviewed 3,202 refugees in Lebanon and in Jordan. And we have interviewed both registered and non-registered refugees to also see how the registration status uh, impacts upon uh, specific vulnerabilities. Then, in total, seven areas were covered, four in Lebanon and three in Jordan. And overall, what we found that these uh, persons with specific needs actually account for 30% of the overall refu refugee population, so meaning almost one in three is relevant to the discussions that we'll be having today. And to give you a closer uh, insight, so you'll see <coughs> on the, the screen, uh, impairment was found among 22.4% of refugees, uh, where impairment, we say, uh, people living with a physical impairment, an intellectual impairment, or a sensorial impairment. And one in five of refugees living with an impairment is affected by, by more than one of them, which, as you can see here, there's an interaction, so you can see there's a, there's a strong correlation with certain types of impairments. Uh, I think this is very important so that when we do see a physical impairment, uh, there's definitely, as the percentages show, a need to look beyond that and see whether there's, there's actually something more uh, in terms of vulnerabilities that we might not be catching. And that's, that's the same for intellectual and sensory impairments. Um, so one in five refugees is living with an impairment. Going back <coughs> to uh, the overall chart, injuries, um, as, as you might know uh, regarding the context of the Syria crisis, it's a highly disabling crisis. We find that 5.7% of refugees in, in Jordan and Lebanon have, are living with a significant injury. And 80% and of these injuries are actually caused by the conflict directly. Uh, and also, well, later on, I, I can go further into detail as to what that breakdown of injury uh, is. There are gunshot wounds uh, uh, and uh, shellings, so there's a high rate of persons living with amputations and spinal cord injuries. Then chronic disease is another, and that's the third factor in, uh, in specific needs. We've identified that 15.6% of all refugees are living with a chronic illness. Uh, in this, in this category, the older people are overrepresented. We find that more than half of older persons are living with a chronic illness, having all sorts of implications for the health response, which I'll come back to later. Um, for your information, older people uh, represent 5% of, of the refugee, refugee population, which so far uh, they have been underestimated as only three out of four older people is actually registered as a refugee. So the identification process there uh, shall be discussed later. <coughs> then the practical uh, implications um, of specific needs. What we, what we try to do in this report and what you'll see in the analysis uh, outlined in the report is that what do these specific needs mean? What is the impact of impairment? What is the impact of chronic disease? And what is the impact of an injury of, of people's daily lives? Um, so, for example, daily li some examples of activities of daily living would be bathing, eating, uh, house making. So daily living activities would be the ability for someone to live independently without support. Uh, 
that's the, the most important uh, thing to keep in mind here. Uh, so when we do see that people have difficulties in this area, this means that there is absolutely a need for additional support and uh, um, giving attention to family-based or community-based um, services. So 18.1% of all refugees <coughs> uh, out indicate that they have difficulties with uh, daily living activities. Um, for persons with specific needs, that goes up to 45%. And for people without any specific needs, it's 5.9%. So there's definitely uh, a, big, a big difference where we find people with impairment, chronic disease or injury. There's a very high likelihood that they need support in their very basic daily living. So this has, uh, this has implications for the ability for them to reach fixed points for for uh, accessing basic services, perhaps also for them to to communicate with service providers on their needs or uh, uh, trying to access information. So we try to really highlight uh, the aspect of daily living activities in in how we can address and, and respond through humanitarian assistance. Um, we have looked at registration, as I said, and and to see whether or not uh, persons with specific needs are or are not uh, less registered. We have seen that, uh, in particular in Lebanon, 16% of people living with an impairment are not registered. This is not significantly different from the group that is living without impairment, um, but there, there are two things to highlight in this regard, is that obviously people living with an impairment Will have uh, will often have an increased need for access to to specific services and basic services um, because of their because of their situation. And the other thing that we identified in this research is that those living with an impairment who have been registered are often not identified according to their specific needs. So their the registration might be there, but it's uh, very often the case that their specific needs are not identified, and therefore. Uh, later on in the response are very difficult to address. Older people, we found, and this is again for Lebanon, one in four older persons in Lebanon is not registered as a refugee. Uh, so that, that means one in four is very unlikely to be on the radar of, of the bigger humanitarian response. Um, and again, this is something that we we're, we're trying to, to provide uh, recommendations and support into how how this can be improved through different methods of registration and, and interagency uh, coordination to ensure that uh, all the people are adequately registered. Then what we looked at uh, in addition to the specific needs is how signs of psychosocial distress, of psychological distress are uh, affecting persons with specific needs. Uh, and as you can see in this chart, uh, the red line is people living with a chronic illness, an injury, or an impairment. And in all areas, they are disproportionately affected by signs of psychological distress compared to the groups who are not affected by any of these uh, characteristics. In some cases, it's, it's triple-fold cogn uh, cognitive difficulties. It's three times uh, as, as prevalent as in the other groups. Um, the uh, Pardon me. The behavioral difficulties again, it's double, and for emotional difficulties, it's uh, it's nearly nearly half double. So there, when we when we look at the at the humanitarian response, and this is a global trend that uh, psychosocial support services are often directed first to children, to to women uh, who are at risk of uh, SGBV. This group we see uh, ha is also disproportionately affected by. Uh, by psychological distress. However, we don't see this being reflected in the in the response uh, accordingly. And this is something that we advocate for, that they are being considered as more at risk of psychological distress and more in need of psychosocial support so that they are prioritized according to, to their needs. Mm -hmm. To give you an idea, 65% uh, of older people present signs of psychological distress which is three times as high as for the overall population. And for persons with specific needs, the one that we have zoomed in on, it's twice as high. So this is, this is the group that we're, we're looking at. Then, no, no slides. Uh, going to the implications of the report and to um, 
really what the aim of the report is, is to have, to have this evidence and this quantitative data inform uh, uh, efforts, joint efforts for improvement. So where we see this can be done is uh, at the very first stage, it would be uh, at the registration and identification process. Uh, so registration process for becoming registered as a refugee and therefore becoming visible, uh, more visible to the humanitarian response, but also by all actors involved who who have uh, who do screenings, who do identification assessments, everyone collecting information to make sure that disability and aging issues are on their radar. That's something that where a lot of capacity can be built. The second one is that where registration and identification is not uh, um, done adequately, we we are seeing that these groups are falling through the cracks, and this this has implications for the impartiality of the of the humanitarian response. So we think we think that by having the identification uh, done properly and adjust the the services provided accordingly, it, there can be there is a way to make this humanitarian response. Uh, inclusive, despite the large scale of uh, of the response, then uh, a breakdown of uh, sex, age, and disability desegregated data. So where we do collect information, we should see that it is done in a in a way that really maps uh, the proportion of older people in areas of persons living with disability and which type of disability, so that humanitarian actors have the information they need to to design their their programming accordingly then the smart funding is something that we're looking at we're looking at an enormous crisis the Syria crisis is something that is of of a magnitude and still growing and that will be protected uh, there is only a limited uh, amount of funding uh, obviously as, as is always the case we advocate for in particular the targeting of funds that we want to see the, r the response and the assistance reach the most vulnerable. So when we talk about chronic illness, when we talk about psychological distress, when we talk about injuries and the need for rehabilitation care and long-term rehabilitation care, this should be at the top of the, of the agenda to make sure that the most vulnerable groups are included and targeted rather than uh, excluded from the response. The health system response, uh, the support is uh, something that we are seeing a huge need for at the moment and also when we look at the implications for this crisis in the future. 5.7% uh, of refugees is living with a significant injury. Uh, and as I described before, the, the types of injuries that we are seeing, imp amputations, spinal cord injuries uh, are, are very high in ratio. And this has considerable implications already. At the moment we are seeing that humanitarian responders are able to a certain extent to respond to this overall demand but in the long run, definitely, it's not something that can be sustained. And there needs to be uh, a big effort uh, to, to build the capacity of national systems to deal with this long-term uh, disabling effect of the crisis. Um, the <coughs> other area where we see the, the health system uh, needs support and long-term support is in the, the area of chronic disease management and chronic disease services. Uh, at the moment, uh, the high, the high case load, 15.6 percent of refugees living with a chronic disease are not, across the board, are not accessing the the care that they that they need. There's a, a need for uh, screening and uh, d chronic disease management for health education, for follow up, uh, laboratory, medical uh, supplies. These are all things that. At the moment, they are, I would say, at crisis level, but it's something in the long term is, uh, if we project it to the long term, there, there's a, a, big, a big need to, to increase that capacity at national levels. And I think uh, I have reached the end of the, of the presentation, so I'll pass over the, the microphone. <laughs> Edith, thank you very much for that, I thought, very clear and uh, empirically grounded uh, presentation. Um, sobering findings, but what was really good, I think it, you have some very useful recommendations as well, which you have specifically targeted at different agencies and, and, and different uh, providers, which is really helpful. Um, I'm going to turn now to the lady sitting on my left, Arushi. Uh, is that all right to go yes. to you first? Yes. Mm -hmm.
probably be checked with the others. If it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Sure. Thank you very much. Um, I'm just going to introduce uh, Arushi to you first. Uh, so Arushi Ray is the Senior Community <laughs> Services Officer at UNHCR Jordan and she's responsible for community-based protection interventions in Jordan, focusing on refugees with specific needs, including the elderly and disabled. And she brings 15 years of experience in humanitarian and development fields with various NGOs and UN agencies. And before Jordan, she served in different capacities in India, South Africa, Botswana, Egypt, and Sudan, and she holds a dual master's degree in social work and political sciences. So, Rishi, please, over to All you. All right. 